Hello everybody. Today we're going to continue talking about these very special molecules called enzymes. So in class we have been talking about how enzymes work, how enzymes they will break down or build molecules called substrates. And how they do this is that the substrate will bind with the enzyme at the special place called the active site so that the enzyme can then either break the substrate or put the two substrate molecules together. And the active site has a shape that matches the shape of the substrate molecules so they can fit together like puzzle pieces. So we have a substrate molecule and an enzyme. That substrate will bind to the enzyme at the active site here. It'll fit into that little pocket and then the enzyme will split apart the substrate into products. When you did your toothpicase activity, you started thinking about some factors that could affect how enzyme reactions work. And so we're gonna talk about those today. First is increased enzymes. If you add more enzymes to a reaction, then the rate of the reaction is going to be faster. It's because there are more enzymes doing the work, breaking down or building substrate molecules, meaning that more products can be formed. So if we look at this graph, we see that as the enzyme concentration goes up, so does the rate of the reaction. This would be like if you had multiple people breaking toothpicks in your toothpick haze activity. You had two people breaking toothpicks, you're going to break the toothpicks much faster than if it was just one person. The next is increased substrate. If you add more substrate, at first, the rate of reaction is going to increase. More substrate means that the enzyme could make more products. So just like in the toothpicase activity, you notice that as the number of broken toothpicks increased, it slowed down the rate of reaction because you had to find all the unbroken toothpicks in the um, mess of broken toothpicks. So if you start with more toothpicks, then it's going to be easier to find the unbroken toothpicks, and the rate of reaction is going to increase a little bit. But there's going to be a point called the saturation point, and that's here on the graph where you see it start to level off. This is where increasing the amount of substrate isn't going to affect the reaction rate. And that is because enzymes can only work so fast. Just like you can only break so many toothpicks in a given amount of time. There's limitations to how fast you can go. Just because you are given more toothpicks doesn't mean that you're going to be able to break them faster and faster and faster all the time. There's going to be a point where you're just breaking them as fast as you can. You can't possibly break them any faster. And so enzymes do this too. There becomes a point where they're breaking as much substrate molecules down as fast as they can, and they just can't break them any, more, uh, any faster than they already are. So the next couple slides talk about how um, different environmental factors can influence the shape of enzymes. So just as a review, enzymes are proteins that are made of amino acid monomers, and these amino acids will fold and twist and coil into unique three-dimensional shapes. And the shape of the molecule is going to determine its function, just like the shape of an active site is going to determine which substrates it can break down. Here's the thing about enzymes. Enzymes are kind of like Goldilocks. You know the story of Goldilocks and the three beers where everything had to be just right. Can't be too hot, can't be too cold, it's got to be just the right temperature. And enzymes are like Goldilocks. They work under what's called optimum or the best pH and temperature ranges. 
If it's outside of the optimum, enzymes start to unfold or denature. They start to lose that unique three-dimensional shape. A denatured enzyme is a non-functioning enzyme, an enzyme that can no longer do its job. And this is because when an enzyme is denatured, the active site gets changed. Why do you think this causes the enzyme to stop working? The enzyme stops working because if the shape of the active site is changed, then the enzyme's active site no longer has the correct shape and the substrate can't fit into the enzyme, and so the reaction doesn't happen. So this is an example of a denatured enzyme. We have our enzyme with our active site with a shape, but if we denature it, by taking it out of its optimum pH or temperature range. And then you see the active site here gets all wonky. It's a different shape. And so it's not going to be able to fit its substrate molecule like a puzzle piece anymore. Here's another image showing denaturation. Here is an enzyme with its unique three-dimensional shape and the active site in here. But as soon as we denature it, you notice that the shape is completely changed and there's no longer an active site. So this enzyme, if it's denatured, it's not going to be able to break down its substrates. So how do hot and cold temperatures affect enzymes? Remember, enzymes are like Goldilocks. They like an optimal temperature. So if it's too cold, the enzyme's going to work slowly. And as you increase the temperature, the enzyme works a little bit faster. This is like if you were to hold some ice cubes before you were breaking your toothpicks. You probably still could break them, but your fingers would be numb and they'd be really stiff and cold and would be hard to move. Enzymes work the same way. But when you hold onto ice, the shape of your hands doesn't actually change. And so you're not denaturing enzymes by putting them in the cold, you're just slowing them down. And if you increase the temperature towards the optimal temperature, the rate of the reaction is going to increase. But once you go past the optimal temperature, you see that the rate of reaction drops very, very rapidly. And that is because it's at this point the enzyme starts to lose its shape. It gets too hot. Now you can imagine denaturing as like frying an egg. What happens to the white part? So when you cook an egg, you know that the whites of the eggs, they start off as clear and the liquid, but after you add heat, they turn opaque white and are solid. That's because the proteins in that egg white have been denatured. And so the enzymes will denature too. And as they denature, they lose their shape and they lose their function and can no longer break down substrate. If we go back to that toothpicase activity, imagine if you were to tape all your fingers together, that would be like denaturing the active site of your hands because if you tape all your fingers together, you change the shape of your hands and you can no longer move your fingers to break those toothpicks. And so the number of toothpicks you were able to break would drastically do. pH works the same way. pH is a measure of how acidic something is. If um, the environment that the enzyme is in is too acidic or too basic, that's going to cause the enzyme to denature too. So if we look at this graph, we can see three different enzymes in the human body. The first one, pepsin, is found in your stomach. It has an optimum pH around three because if you think about what's in your stomach, you have a lot of acid in your stomach. And so this enzyme really likes acidic environment. So it's gonna work best when the environment's really acidic. But if you notice, if you go um, higher, 
in the pH, that enzyme activity drops rapidly because that enzyme's again starting to denature. Another enzyme, salivary amylase, is found in your mouth. That works best around the pH of 7. Your mouth isn't very acidic or very basic, and so it likes that environment best. But if you go above or below that pH, the enzyme's going to denature. And then we have one last enzyme that lives in your intestines, and it likes it a little bit more on the basic side, and so it's going to um, denature above and below its favorite pH. So the optimum pH and temperature of an enzyme is going to depend on the type of enzyme. And the last thing are enzyme inhibitors. An enzyme inhibitor is a molecule that's gonna interfere with the enzyme activity. These are molecules that have similar shapes to substrates, and so they will compete with the substrate by blocking the substrate from entering the, bi the uh, active site. So if you see here, we have a substrate molecule that fits the enzyme, but we also have a competitive inhibitor that can also fit into that active site pocket, and if it gets in there, then the substrate can't get in there. A lot of poisons are enzyme inhibitors. So this is like that question in the toothpickase lab asking about the plastic unbreakable toothpicks mixed in with the wooden ones. If you accidentally were to pick up an, an unbreakable toothpick, that's gonna slow you down because you have to go back and search for the wooden ones that you are able to break. Here is your exit ticket. Students investigated the effect of acid rain on photosynthesis. Several plants were given water with a pH of four each day for two months. The results showed that the plant had a reduced rate of photosynthesis. How did the acidic water most likely reduce the plant's rate of photosynthesis? A, by storing excess oxygen produced by the plants. B, changing the effectiveness of enzymes in the plants. C, by causing root hairs to grow on the roots of the plants. Or D, increasing the amount of carbon dioxide taken in by the plants. Our answer is B, changing the effectiveness of the enzymes in the plants. Photosynthesis is a chemical reaction, and remember all chemical reactions in living things require enzymes, and enzymes work best at specific temperature and pHs, their optimum temperature and pH. And if we add an acid to uh, a plant, that's going to affect the enzymes that do photosynthesis for the plant. And so it's going to denature the enzymes that do photosynthesis. And then it, it, the plant isn't going to be able to do photosynthesis as much.